Good evening. My name is Luc. I'm from France. And in 2014 was the first time where I visited Mississippi or the US for that matter. So back then, I'm alone in the kitchen and I decide to make chicken like I've done so many times before. So I take my chicken, I season it, I preheat the oven, put it in the oven, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and something's wrong with my chicken because it's not cooking. So what is going on? And then it hits me. The oven is in Fahrenheit. <laughs> so there was no way that my chicken was going to cook at 180 Fahrenheit. <laughs> so this was the first time where I experienced firsthand culture shock here. When you live for long enough in a new country, you will experience the four stages of culture shock. The first one is the honeymoon stage, where everything is awesome, you love everything about this new country, and you don't want to leave ever. Then you have the frustration. During the frustration, you start to notice the little details that annoy you, and you compare your own country with your new country, and you basically think that my country is better than yours. Then you have adaptation. During adaptation, you make the better out of things, you power through, and you try to work your way through your new situation. And then you have acceptance. You reach a new equilibrium, and you start to see the good and the bad, but you've made peace with it, and you're ready to move on with your life. So coming from a country that uses the metric system, it's pretty frustrating to use uh, all of those units that you have here. <laughs> So there are many reasons why I think that the metric system is superior than the imperial units. But the, reason, the story that I like to tell is the story of the creation of the Fahrenheit scale, since we were talking about it. So introducing Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. In 1724, he decides to create a scale to measure temperature. So to create a scale, it's easy. You need a cold temperature of reference and a warm temperature of reference. So for the cold, he figured that there was this one winter when he was younger in 1708 in his, home, in his hometown of Poland where it was especially cold. So he thought that would be a good point of reference. Now he just needed a warm temperature of reference. So what is warm? What is readily available? Blood. Blood is warm. Blood is readily available. So some stories say that he used the blood of a horse, or even his own blood. The point is that it is completely arbitrary choices. In comparison, the Celsius scales uses properties of water, from 0 to 100 between the freezing and the boiling point. So in my opinion, there is one scale out of the two that is better than the other. <laughs> but I'll let you guess which one. The point is that those two scales are completely arbitrary. And those arbitrary choices that were made a long time ago have long-term repercussions even today. When you come here, you have to deal with a lot of units like miles, feet, inches. Just two days ago, I was in a classroom, and the teacher had to write on the board for the students that were going to take a test that one mile was 5,280 feet. Because how do you remember that? So I want to spend just a little bit of time on the inch. You all know the inch, right? But how did it come about in the first place? Well, for that, you need to go back to the 14th century under the reign of King Edward II in England. At that time, it was decided that three grains of barley corn, dry and round, put end to end, would make one inch. Right. So you're going to say, well, this is completely archaic. Nobody ever uses that anymore. Why even bother? Well, think again, because next time you go and buy a pair of shoes, you remember that the difference between a 7 and an 8 is one barley corn. It's a third of an inch. So then again, a choice that was made a long time ago has long-term repercussions today. So today, I want to focus on the metric system. I want to tell you about that because it just underwent a major change. But how did it come about in the first place? Well, for that, you need to go back to the French Revolution. In 1789, 
there were over 800 different units that were used in France. And sometimes the definition would change from one town to another. It was a big mess. So a year later, in 1780, the Constituent Assembly decided to come up with a new system based on number 10, a decimal system that would use properties of matter and the geometry of the Earth. They put the best minds of the, of the age to work on that so that they could create a system that nobody could effectively own. It would be, according to their motto, for all people and for all times. So this system underwent a lot of changes along the year. We're not going to go into the details. But this year, in 2019, on the 20th of May, is going to get a new definition. And four out of the seven base units are going to, redefine, to be redefined. But my favorite one is the kilogram. Because as of today, the kilogram is the last of the units to be defined on a physical artifact. That physical artifact is a cylinder made of metal. It's called the international prototype of the kilogram, or le grand K, as it's called usually. And it's stored in an underground basement in a suburb of Paris, and a three bell glass of uh, bell glass, glasses. And it's only taken out on very special occasions. Scientists even argue whether or not they should clean it before they take it out, because you never know. You could remove a few atoms. So now you start, you start realizing what is wrong with it. Because what if somebody were to drop that international prototype and remove atoms out of it? Well, the consequence would be that the mass of the universe, or actually its numerical value, would change instantaneously. Because by definition, this artifact is one kilogram, exactly. So we need to change that. Most of the other units, actually all of the other units that exist, are based on the fundamental constant of the universe. The most famous one is the speed of light that we know exactly and never changes. The speed of light defines the meter uh, according with the definition of the second. But for the kilogram, there is no obvious answer. What constant should we use? Well, there is a chosen one. The chosen one is called the Planck constant. So without going into too much details, the Planck constant is especially relevant to describe the energy of particles at a very small level, on a quantum level. And what you need to know about it is that today we've been able to measure it to a very high degree of precision. So what we're going to do, just like we did for the speed of light, we're going to log this value, we're going to log the number that we chose for the Planck constant, and thanks to a carefully designed balance called the Kibble balance, using electromagnetic properties, we can use this value and back define the kilogram. And this is going to happen, happen on the 20th of May of this year. So who cares, right? How is it going to affect me or you? Well, first of all, it's going to be important for people working in the pharmaceutical industry because as of the 20th of May, it will, we will have the same accuracy to measure very small amounts of chemicals as we have for measuring very big masses like the mass of the sun. All the same accuracy all across the system. And second of all, the last time we did such a similar redefinition was for the second. In 1967, we were starting to play with what we call atomic clocks that allow us to measure time with a precision that was never achieved before. So when the second was redefined then, nobody was suspecting that even 60 years later, we would all be walking around with a smartphone connected to internet and GPS, which are all networks that require a high level of synchronicity. So for that reason, I'm very hopeful that in a few years from now, we will have the same types of unexpected breakthrough that will result from the redefinition of the kilogram. Actually, major industries 
uh, are benefiting already from this change, and they're getting ready. So if the metric system is so great, why hasn't the United States made the transition yet? Well, first of all, is it the only country in that situation? Well, not really. So there is the US, and there is also Liberia, a small country in Africa, <laughs> and there is Myanmar in Asia. Both of those two are actually in the process of transitioning right now. <laughs> so let's rewind. Let's rewind to 1999. I love to tell that story. So NASA is sending a probe to Mars. It's called the Mars Climate Orbiter. It's supposed to orbit Mars and study its climate. So it goes on a long journey of nine months, perfectly smooth, and it gets there and it has to start the, the maneuver for orbiting the planet. And then, when the maneuver starts, the probe is lost. Probably it just crashed on the planet. So, what happened? Well, the investigation showed that the company, the subcontractor that was supposed to take care of the computations of the trajectory at the entry of orbit, made computations using imperial units. They used feet, they used pounds, they used inches, and, they, they, and then they sent those results back to the rest of the program that was using metric units written by NASA. So as you can imagine, the, on the receiving end, they just, complete, they just got completely wrong result, results. And this resulted in the loss of $125 million. If only there had been a system that everybody could use and agree on, <laughs> this would not, would not have happened, right? Well, to be fair, the United States kind of already did adopt the metric system. In 1975, sorry, there was the Metric Conversion Act. And the purpose of that was to promote the adoption of the metric system in the US. But when you read it, the key word is that it is a voluntary conversion. And who says voluntary says we're not going to do it because it's too annoying. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, because back in France in 1780, when they redefined the units, I can tell you the French people were not happy about it either. So I understand uh, why would you would be reluctant to change. But the big companies that trade internationally they went ahead and adopted the metric system. It made their design process easier, and they were more competitive internationally. So now they, they completely transition, and they reap the benefits already. So now I have one question for you. Do you know your height in meters? I know my height in feet and inches. I'm five feet eight and a half, which makes me one meter and 74 centimeters tall. So when this talk is over, I would love for you to go and check out your height, so that when you meet somebody like me who comes from another, another country, and you come to talk about that, you can tell them that. And if you want to go the extra mile, or the extra kilometer, <laughs> you, you can even go and figure out your weight. That would be awesome. <laughs> but so I took the liberty of doing some research for you. I want to meet you halfway. I want to meet you where you are. So I made some research to bring the metric system to you in values and quantities that might be more relatable for Americans. So introducing the metric system for Americans. So if I say one kilogram for all intents and purposes, it's about two pounds, or the mass of one quart of beer. <laughs> one meter, for all intents and purposes, it's one yard. One kilometer is the length of nine football fields put end to end, including the end zones. <laughs> and finally, the temperature. Um, oh, actually, I have one more. So. The, the liter for measuring milk, for example. 
One liter is a little bit more than one quart. And finally, the temperature. I want to finish with the temperature because this is where we started. So for the temperature, we can memorize this. 30 is hot, 20 is nice, 10 is cold, 0 is ice. <laughs> I'll say it again. 30 is hot, 20 is nice, 10 is cold, 0 is ice. And now if you go down that scale, where it's very, very cold, it's, both, it's uncom uncomfortable for both of us, right? If you go down that scale, the Celsius and the Fahrenheit, they meet at a, at a magic point, what I, what I like to say. At that magic point, you don't need to specify the unit. It's a point where it's both uncomfortable for both of us, but it's a, it's a point where we can both see eye to eye. And that point is minus 40. Thank you. <laughs>